Volcanoes can be dangerous to the people living uh, around them and there's actually more volcanoes in this world than, we, than people may think. So there's 1500 that are uh, active. That doesn't mean they're erupting all the time, but it does mean that uh, they could potentially erupt in the future. And this is something that we should definitely monitor. So traditionally, I think uh, one of the main ways to do this is using seismology. Another way of monitoring a volcano is using ground deformation techniques. The advantages of using gravity is that mainly it, it adds another parameter to uh, what we know about the volcano. So using all the deformation techniques, we know a lot about how the volcano moves, but we don't actually know what's causing this movement. And you can imagine that there's a big difference between unrest at a volcano caused by hydrothermal activity or unrest uh, caused by magma moving into the volcanic system. I am a geophysicist. I work with uh, gravimetry. Uh, what I do basically is the gravimetry of volcanoes and uh, we record gravity and we try to understand what the time changes of gravity means. So Nidion G started uh, when uh, there was this um, uh, publication of this paper about uh, MEMS gravimeters. Uh, that uh, gave us the idea of presenting this proposal uh, under the future and emerging technologies. So there was a um, consortium that formed with uh, six partners from six uh, different countries in Europe. And we made this proposal uh, uh, basically to try to overcome the limitations in uh, terrain gravimetry, which are mainly due to the limitations of um, uh, currently available instrumentation. I worked uh, with gravimetry on different volcanoes like uh, Etna. Etna is a volcano that uh, may uh, give you different kinds of activity. You have explosive activity, very strong explosive activity with uh, lava fountains. At the same time you have uh, lava flows, uh, so you have a range of activity which is very, really wide. Mount Etna is very well monitored. So when you develop new instrumentation, you, you actually want to cross-check your findings using traditional instrumentation and see if they match. And also there's lots of other parameters uh, that we can use from other equipment like uh, seismics, uh, deformation data to cross-check what's going on at the volcano. Everybody knows something about gravity. You know that it's the thing that, that holds you to the ground. So the Earth has a, a certain gravitational pull. But if you were to go to a smaller planet, that has, has less mass. So if you went from the, the Earth to Mars to, to the Moon, um, the gravitational pull would get smaller and smaller and smaller. You can extend that all the way down to a person would have a gravitational pull or a bowling ball would, would have a gravitational pull. Now if you had a, a gravity sensor accurate enough, then you could measure the gravitational pull of that bowling ball. So my role in the Newton G project, I guess you could say it started about six years ago when I started my PhD. We wanted to make a very small and very cheap gravity sensor. Most people already carry a type of gravity sensor in their pockets, um, and that's a, a mobile phone accelerometer. So when you turn the screen sideways, the gravity sensor detects which direction the Earth is by its gravitational pull, and it uses that to turn the screen. Now what we've done is use the same technology, which is mass producible. You can make them small and you can make them cheap, but we've made it about 10,000 times more sensitive. I can demonstrate what, what one of these gravity sensors looks like uh, and we can do that with uh, a slinky, a kind of a long, a long spring like this, uh, and a ball. Uh, now this ball has mass, so it will be attracted to, to anything else that has mass, that's just the, the nature of, of gravity. So because, because you have mass, this ball will want to move towards you. So what I can do is, is mount this ball on the, on the nice soft spring and if I scan along, it will be pulled slightly towards you as I go past. Uh, and by measuring how much it extends when I move past you, I can say something about what your gravitational pull is. If there was a wall between us, I wouldn't be able to see what was going on. So that's when this sort of thing would become really valuable, because if I were to scan it past, I could see what was going on using the gravity, even though I couldn't see visually. This slinky method, and um, this is called a, a relative gravimeter. 
and that's because you measure gravity relative to the extension of, of, a, of a spring. This is great, but they do have some disadvantages. As the temperature changes, it'll, it'll expand and contract. So unless you keep the temperature of the device very, very carefully controlled, um, then you can get a signal that looks like a gravity signal, but it'll just be a, a very accurate measurement of, of temperature. So the, uh, the slinky is not the only way that you can uh, use to measure gravity. Uh, in fact, you can, you can lose the spring altogether. And at that point, you have a ball. Um, now, this is a sort of an experiment you can, you can do yourself practically at home. Uh, you, you drop the ball over a set distance, and if you time how long it takes to fall, that tells you what the, the gravitational acceleration is at your location. So MUQUANTS was solicited by Daniele Carbone because we provide an absolute quantum gravimeter, which is a device that measures gravity in an absolute way, in the sense that it doesn't need to be calibrated with respect to any other quantities or, or instruments. So a technique to measure gravity could be to just let a ball free fall from this ferry wheel. This would probably allow us to access about two to three digits after the comma for the value of g which is good, but not definitely not enough for um, geophysics and, and volcano monitoring. With the quantum technology, we can reach limits where we have access to eight digits after the comma, 10 to the minus nine G. And in that sense, we can resolve very tiny changes of the gravity field. And at this level of precision, everything matters, basically. For example, if the altitude changes of three millimeters, you see the effect on the measurement. It means that we would have to control the altitude of this cabin at the top of this wheel as precisely as millimeter scale, which becomes very, very, very challenging. With regard to the sensor head that we see here, we have the dropping chamber, which is about this dimension in the sensor head and shielded from external magnetic fields. A vertical upcoming laser beam will reach a hollow pyramid retroreflector and with successive reflections within this pyramid this will mimic and gives the six laser beams that are used to do the laser cooling. After a few hundreds of milliseconds atoms will be cooled down and slowed down. We switch off the laser and the test mass, namely the cloud of cold atom, starts its free fall. During the free fall over about 15 centimeters, we apply a sequence of three laser pulses to measure the vertical acceleration that is experienced by the cloud of cold atom. Once the atoms have reached the bottom of the dropping chamber, we flash them with a last light pulse to probe their internal state and read out the measurement. This information is then processed to infer the small g. MEMS gravimeters are actually a very interesting possibility for gravimetry because for the first time we will have a cheap instrument. In this case we will have an array with uh, say uh, 20 devices uh, acquiring continuously so it will be possible to have uh, a very good uh, space and time resolution. Um, so what we'll do is have some sort of grid of sensors. Now because we're putting so many of these devices up these need to be small and they need to be cheap so that they can be easily put up. Now there's, there's disadvantages to these, you know, they, they can drift and they don't make an absolute measurement of, of gravity. Um, so what we need is a, a core quantum sensor to, to tie those sensors together. Now that sensor will provide the primary measurement that will check if there's any other drifts in the device and, and it will tie all of the other devices together. You might say, well why don't you just have a hundred of those? And that's because it's really not possible with the infrastructure. These things are still, they're still quite big and they're more expensive than the, the, the small, cheap mobile phone-like sensors. How does this sort of network of sensors uh, apply to a, a volcano, for, to Etna, for example? Now, what you don't know is, is where this, this magma is going to appear. It might, it might shoot up to the top, to the crater area, um, but it might break through over here and there could be a, a village on the side of Mount Etna. And what you can do with the gravity sensor, the network, is by placing all of these sensors all around the volcano, we can start to say, well, if I see uh, a rising signal over here, 
that maybe suggests that there's some, some magma intruding over here. That's the great thing about having this, these things continuously monitoring. My job is to design the configuration of this network of uh, gravimeters to find the location which allows us to better capture the uh, locations of uh, source, uh, sources of mass change. Just imagine this candle is a source of magma. Just imagine I cannot see the candle and I want to somehow infer where the candle is located. I feel the temperature, I feel the heat on the tip of my finger. If I use uh, only this finger here, I cannot tell whether this heat is coming from a tiny candle here or a big fire far from my finger. But if I use a second finger here, then uh, I have two uh, observations. One of my fingers uh, is, is closer to the candle, so I feel higher temperatures there, whereas the other finger is, is, is slightly farther, so I, I don't feel that much uh, of temperature with my, my second finger. Using these two pieces of information, I get a better idea about where the candle is located. Now imagine uh, if, if I use my third finger and my fourth finger and my thumb, uh, at the tip of uh, each one of my fingers and the tip of my thumb, I'm, I'm uh, feeling, I'm sensing uh, different temperatures. And intersecting these lines, I can uh, get an idea where the candle is located. And this is uh, basically the advantage of having uh, multiple sensors rather than only one sensor. And this is going to be realized in Newton G. The only difference being that uh, rather than my fingers and my thumb, we are going to have gravimeters. And rather than this candle, we are going to have sources of magma. My job is to model what magma does uh, below the surface. I always, like you know, my brother is a sculptor and we always discuss this question about modeling because when he does modeling, it means reproducing reality and making a sculpture of it. And in a way, it's the same in mathematics. So a sculpture is going to communicate to you the perception of reality by a, an artist, while a mathematical model is uh, the perception by a scientist. Or you can do in the laboratory, you take gelatin, gelatin is not rock. The fluids you are going to inject are not magma, but you think that they are going to help you understand him better. Because the processes in the earth are very complex. For example, magma is complex. You have uh, bubbles forming in the magma. You have a lot of heat that wants to come out of the magma and going into rock. You have rock fracturing and creating earthquakes. You have deformation. And if you just look at it like this, you don't understand anything. And so you want to actually take out several of these processes and look at one simple thing at a time, understand that, and then only at the end combine them. I like this project also because it has a very nice uh, integration between modeling and data collection, where modeling is included in the very early stage because then we can uh, help with the setting up of the network and then the data will come at some point optimized already and we are going to be able to um, improve the model in such a way that in the future they may even become predictive. So far of course it's not possible because we don't understand enough of the physical processes but if we reach this understanding then we are going to be able to actually forecast where magma is going to go how much magma is on the run, uh, how fast is the magma going, maybe even how explosive will the eruption be. So the data that is sent from the sensors that is developed by the teams in Glasgow and France, and once the data is sent from the sensor to the base station, it becomes our responsibility to make sure that it's stored in a permanent way. To make the data interoperable with different disciplines, we want to build a bridge to different communities because gravity data may be interesting not just to us, but also to different communities. So what we do is we want to publish this data through the European Plate Observing System so that the, the data can be used by different researchers who may not be so familiar with the way that the gravity community stores their data. Everyone benefits from open data. So these are in the first place, of course, research communities, but also societies. I hope that uh, with this project uh, we will uh, uh, help 
uh, terrain gravimetry to develop uh, because uh, in spite of all the possibilities of this uh, technology, of this methodology, uh, up to date uh, it, it is a really uh, underexploited methodology. The ultimate goal would be to embed this kind of data monitoring in, in real-time observatory monitoring at a volcano. That is not something that, that we can implement in a, in a day, this will take uh, years to, to implement, but I think it will be an extreme leap forward in volcano monitoring in general. I could imagine a time in, in 10, 20 years where there's, there's hundreds or even thousands of volcanoes around that are utilizing cheap sensors to, to monitor what's going underneath and it's going to be a really exciting time to work in volcanology over the next, next 20 years.